to be with you. Um, and uh, we're going to give the first webinar for uh, the Integrative Sound and Music Practitioners Program. Uh, I'm going to give uh, some details about the courses that we're offering, the faculty members, and the courses uh, in, in specific the, that I'll be offering uh, since I'll be teaching 50% of uh, the hours. So um, we thought it would be um, good to dedicate some time at the end to get questions, perhaps around 8 o'clock or a little after 8. This webinar is going to go until 8.30. So uh, if you have any questions, you can send them to Pete. Um, and then we'll address these questions. And um, I have plenty of material to go through, um, additional ones to extemporize on. But I'm going to switch now the slides to uh, the slides that I prepared for this webinar. Um, and first, um, I'd like to go over the faculty members. We have uh, for the second year Issa Barnwell. PhD. She is a wonderful vocal teacher who addresses a um, wide variety of different ways of using the voice and bringing in to her um, knowledge on uh, word music uh, into sound therapy practice. Uh, Sylvia Nakash has been with the program for many years. Uh, Sylvia will teach an entire weekend plus a Monday. Um, of uh, various aspects of sound therapy, focusing on the voice and other theoretical aspects and instruments used in this practice. We have John Beaulieu, who's also been in the program for a long time, uh, and the PhD. He will be going over tuning forks and the system that he <coughs> devised to work with clients. Um, he'll also be offering uh, an additional day, which is a, a Monday following the weekend, uh, to work with uh, people who are in the certification program. So as many of you know that this is a program that one can take in its entirety or one can take certain courses. Uh, so the entire program is, as I said earlier, 120 hour long. It starts in mid-October and it goes through April. Uh, it's almost entirely on weekends. If I remember well, there are only two days that are on Mondays, John Beaulieu's and uh, Sylvia Lacouch. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm suffering from allergies today, so bear with me. Uh, we also have Tom, Thomas Amelio. He is uh, the CEO of uh, the Open Center. He'll be teaching a course on uh, mantras, mantra chanting. Um, and for the first time, we have a wonderful researcher who deals with a very unique aspect of sound and sound research, Howard Barry Schatz. His extensive research on biblical text, the esoteric side of sound and the therapeutic as well is incredibly rich. <clears throat> and um, I encourage you to check out his books on Amazon and also John Beaulieu's and other researchers' uh, books as well, Joshua Leeds as well. Um, we also have Nacho Arimani, who will be talking about rhythms and percussion. Um, he'll be teaching an entire class about that. Joshua Leeds, a um, psychoacoustician, will be addressing a very unique aspect of sound therapy. Um, the term psychoacoustics might seem charged with the complexity. Uh, it's true, but he will be uh, modifying things to a level where anyone and everyone can understand them. It's utterly fascinating uh, subject. And uh, myself, I'm the main facilitator of the program. And uh, I will go over my research and the classes that I'll be teaching this year. Um, so the first weekend, which will be in mid-October, uh, will be sound theory for sound therapy. So sound theory uh, is 
very important. But this is the type of theory that's connected to the practice. Um, as we all know, that the more theory we have, the more sound the practice will be and the more understanding we have. And there's so much to know about sound. There's also, unfortunately, so much to <laughs> dispel. And uh, as, as you may have noticed, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation when it comes to sound. Just Google various things or, or look up some YouTube videos and you'll see the contradictions. So there's a lot of information to share with students about sound. Uh, but these are not um, various theories that are unimportant. They're, they're directly related to the practice and to the education of every individual involved in, in this practice, whether for their personal use or whether they want to work with clients at, at some point. So um, we'll do an entire weekend of sound theory. Uh, this won't be just theoretical information. There will be a lot of examples played in forms of video or demonstrations on instrument uh, and also in audio form. Uh, by the way, any questions you have about the courses or any of the slides that I'll be go over, please uh, ask them at the end of uh, the talk. Uh, this year, I will be dedicating an entire weekend <coughs> for instrumental playing technique. This is obviously a very important uh, course, which uh, teaches uh, the basics and more uh, on how to use various instruments. Clearly, we won't be able to cover everything there is to cover on all of the instruments, but definitely a great amount to get yourself started with and, and to continue uh, learning on your own or with specialists uh, in New York or in the city where you reside. I know just like last year there would be a lot of people coming from out of town either commuting for these specific courses or coming and staying here for a few months uh, or a combination of the, of the two. That's how it has been so far. So um, what are the instruments that I'll, that I'll be addressing in, uh, in this weekend, uh, gongs. I'm going to state the primary instruments that I use in sound therapy. So gongs of various types, diameters, and traditions. Um, Himalayan singing bowls. And notice that I'm using the term Himalayan, not Tibetan. Uh, Himalayan is a more correct term uh, because when you say Himalayan, then you include all singing bowls, not just singing bowls that come from Tibet. They come from Nepal, they come from various countries, northern India, countries basically that are part of the Himalayas. Um, and we talk thoroughly about Himalayan singing bowls, how to choose bowls and with the right frequencies, how to use various techniques and so on and so forth. And uh, by the way, um, all of these techniques are applicable to crystal bowls. I know crystal bowls um, are very popular these days. Um, so it's up to you which ones you, you want to get. But whatever you can learn on Himalayan singing bowls would be applicable on the crystal bowls. Um, I'll also be talking about the voice in a thorough way. Um, the different use of voice in toning and vocalization in other forms, views. And um, I would address other instruments, various mallet instruments, uh, discs, bells, shruti box, and uh, instruments that I used in sound therapy that come from different shamanic societies. They're used to ground people, such as rain sticks, uh, rattles, shakers, frame drums, uh, and, and uh, these instruments are not necessarily overtone emitting instruments, Overton emitting instruments, such as gongs, bowls, discs, bells, that you reduce, are the primary instruments that I use in sound therapy or sound healing. You will notice that I'm mostly using sound therapy instead of sound healing, and I'll tell you why in a bit. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I favor sound therapy as a term. I find it to be 
uh, more descriptive, um, less promising, less gimmicky, yes, um, and more fair to the individuals participating. Um, sound healing does not suggest some effort that the individuals participating need to make. This is where most of the magic is. It's what the individual receiving uh, does in the experience other than being there. There are various ways of being there, different levels of awareness, various forms of listening, and being engaged in the experience. What I look for when I do sound therapy session is to have active participation, collaboration, because those who are present receiving, are, their role is not neutral. They have actually the most important role, which is having the awareness of the mind, listening judiciously, attentively, having great level of presence, and listening with intention, listening with scrutiny, listening with knowledge, and getting the mind out of the way, which is the hardest aspect. So sound healing <clears throat> is nebulous and it's confusing. And I've heard that numerous times from people. People really don't understand what that means. They don't understand whether sound heals them or whether I heal them with sound. Uh, neither is actually entirely correct. I certainly don't heal people with sound. I'm not a healer. I'm a healing uh, facilitator. So that's, in my humble opinion, what healers are. They're healing facilitators. And it's very important, especially these days, to become careful with the language that we use because there are implications and consequences. Uh, when people don't ask clarifying questions, they may understand something in the wrong way. And therefore, the important role that they need to have would not be exercised, applied here. So that's briefly why I favor sound therapy over sound healing. Uh, people heal themselves. We heal ourselves. People don't heal us. Practitioners, facilitators uh, who work with us give us methods, tools. They facilitate specific experience. They support us. They encourage us. They push us. They suggest certain things. But at the end, it's us who heal ourselves. And not the practitioner, not sound by itself. Our free will attention and awareness is always involved, and that's something that we need to start discussing a lot more. So that's briefly about uh, my uh, my favoring uh, to the term. I call my practice sound meditation. Um, and by the way, I'm not the first person to use these two terms, sound therapy or sound meditation. I certainly did not coin them. Uh, I'm not the first and the last to use them. I just find a great value and, and uh, fairness of use. Sound meditation suggests that the person is engaged in meditation while working with sound, which is truly what we need to do. Getting the moderated way, letting the attention rest on the sound. The attention is the spotlight of our consciousness. The mindset is very, very important in sound therapy in other holistic practices. Uh, mindset includes attention, intention, and will. Um, so, but my sound meditation practice, which we'll address thoroughly in the last course that I'll be offering, is an integrated holistic practice. Uh, allow me to talk about it now, skipping through the other ones, and I'll get back to them. <clears throat> Basically, I use not only uh, instruments used in sound therapy, it's based around that, but I also use um, breathing exercises, I use guided visualizations, and other aspects that I'll expand on them later on. So that's briefly the definition of uh, sound meditation and the difference between sound meditation and sound therapy. I'll expand on this in a bit. Let me go, get back to point number three, this class that class, Transcendental and Psychedelic States of Sound. Um, 
through my independent research that I started 11 years ago in my uh, training at the university uh, in music. I did four degrees in music over 12 years. I studied uh, music theory and composition. That was my double major. I performed a lot of different musical uh, styles, traditions, and instruments. I studied composition and, and I conducted a lot. And later on, we went on to do three master's degrees and I was doing a PhD in, in ethnomusicology, but I also studied uh, music education. So the combination of everything that I studied gave me and researched and, and also my work with people and the field work that I've done in over 40 countries. So keep in mind that everything that I teach is the product of uh, everything that I learned so far, whether in higher education, um, involving the different practices and the subjects that I studied, my work with people, my um, uh, research, my field work in scientific studies. And that's why my approach is different than other sound therapists. Uh, I bring a lot into it um, knowledge from ethnomusicology, for example. Uh, bringing into the practice how sound has been used by different civilizations, different cultures, why musical systems, harmonic systems are different than ours, uh, how one can ameliorate the practice, and also bring into it the, the, the scientific studies that I've done and the, the multidisciplinary approach to better understand sound. Sound is the most complex tool. It's an incredibly powerful. It's not an accident that music is very popular and that music has been used in a wide variety of different settings and different religions different for, for religious purposes, for spiritual purposes, holistic purposes, and so on, and shamanism, certainly. So there's a great reason for all of that. So uh, sound <clears throat> is a transcendental and psychedelic tool. Um, what does that mean? Well, what is the definition of transcendental? Transcendental is experiencing something beyond the material world. You probably know of famous meditation practice, transcendental meditation. That means one is, is transcending the material world by going inward, in a, in, a, in a word, inner word, or outer word. It's kind of the same, really, <laughs> as we're finding more and more. Um, that's beyond this word, consensual reality. Psychedelic is a, is a word in ancient Greek. The etymology means manifesting the mind or revealing the mind. I'm sure those of you who have had sound therapy practice, sound healing, sound bath, gong bath, there are many different names. Unfortunately, there are more and more names. They all mean the same thing. I think it's very important to, to keep things, uh, describe things as they are, instead of using different branding tactics, because I need to address this because this is very confusing to people, and I always get these questions. People ask me, what is the difference between a gong bass and a sound bass? Vibrational healing, sound healing, sound therapy. <clears throat> I keep on seeing more terms new terms and people also give me terms that I've never heard. Anyway, so uh, <clears throat> when you have a, such an experience, you experience your mind in a different way, the different way than the normal way, <laughs> the kind of the monkey mind way that's <laughs> with us every day, huh? the chatter that's in our mind. When we work with a, par with a powerful tool such as sound, the mind kind of subsides and we start to experience more of signal, more than noise. Huh? There's a difference between signal and noise. So when we quiet the mind, we are able to tap more into inner faculties that we have within us, or quietude in, in our space, and a wide variety of different things. So all of these things can be described as psychedelic states. Why? Because the mind is manifesting, is being revealed in a different way than the usual. The usual is being, you know, in consensual reality. 
the mind is always busy, especially these days, where we're bombarded by so much, uh, with so much information, uh, technology, computers, and cell phones, and the various frequencies that surround us all the time, electromagnetics wreaking havoc on our system, uh, autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> so these are things that we need to address, and this is probably why more and more people feel the need to resort to various practices for well-being, and holistic practices, meditation, yoga, working with sound, and, and so on. It's very, very important to increase the level of maintenance and therapy because of how rapidly our life is changing and how it's being impacted by technology, which is furthering our consciousness but it's definitely something to keep watch on and to um, uh, be careful with. Working with sound is the ultimate tool for all of that. I know this on a personal level, but also on a professional level with people I work with all the time. So uh, in this class, I'll be talking thoroughly about how sound can produce a transcendental uh, and or psychedelic state and why, how that manifests. And also, um, uh, there will be another course dedicated to the medicinal quality of sound. Is sound the medicine of the future? In this course, I will address a lot the current scientific studies, uh, whether benefiting science or medicine. Uh, we need both of them. We need a lot more research than what's being done. Um, medicine and science, fortunately, are starting to take sound more and more seriously. But that's something we can use a lot more. Um, yeah. So the next course that I'll be teaching is the practitioner and the receiver in sound work. This is a very important topic that is rarely addressed, which is the dynamics between the two. <coughs> Um, I will be addressing uh, a lot of basic psychology that practitioners would need to know. You don't have to be a psychologist to know these things. If you have the intention to work with your family members, friends, acquaintances, or with clients, you must know these basic things. Um, to improve the etiquette between the two parties, to know the duties that a practitioner needs to have, the awareness that one would need to have to be better at being in service, to enhance the inherent capacity that your client, the receiver, has within them. Unfortunately, when we don't understand something, because of our curiosity and our need to want to come up with answer, very often we end up by conjuring up an explanation. And a conjured up explanation doesn't necessarily mean that this is the real thing. Whatever we're thinking of and whatever we believe in doesn't necessarily mean that that's the reality. The inner reality is not necessarily the, the fully agreed on reality the standard reality, the real reality. And that's something that we need to understand more and more by learning about what reality is. And that's something that I'll be talking about throughout because that is connected to how sound really impacts us and why. So uh, such a class, the practitioner and the receiver in sound work, is immensely important to pay attention to the dynamics between the two on a much closer level to optimize the experience and not just to free up the self and think, oh, sound's going to take care of everything or my healing, my capacity as a healer is going to heal the people I'm working with. That's really nonsense. It's rudimentary at best. So it's very important to learn basic things um, and not just basics. I mean, this would go pretty much in depth. Um, yeah. Um, the next course, the use of sound in shamanism. 
This is a very important course for various reasons. Shamanism, as we know, is an ancient practice. At one point in the past, all societies were shamanic societies. A lot of them still exist. Most people are now familiar with Amazonian shamanism. It's on the rise. <coughs> but um, uh, shamanism is not only found in the Amazon basin uh, or only in North America, North and South America, in the Americas. It's found everywhere. Uh, the word shaman t comes from a Tungusic language from Siberia. Um, a Russian anthropologist borrowed this term and became used in uh, various languages, including English, uh, from the Siberian language, uh, from the Tungusic area, from uh, the Evenki people. Uh, this happened in uh, the 1890s. The word itself means the one who knows. <clears throat> so now it's common to go to Africa or to the Amazon and find people who do this work calling themselves shamans. So it became a standard word that's used. But shamans or shaman, shamaness, female form, of the name, uh, medicine man, curandero, uh, there are various terms that are equivalent to the word shaman uh, are used because shamanic societies still exist in Africa, in various places in Asia, in Europe, in Southeast Asia, certainly in the Americas North. Central and South America have done a lot of field work with um, shamanic societies, uh, studying why sound and researching why sound has been used, is being used, has always been used in shamanic societies. This was one of the three perspectives that I focused on uh, in my research on sound. The other two are uh, the use of sound in Eastern philosophies, mantra and sutra systems and chants. The third perspective is uh, the use of sound in, and what do we know about sound in uh, through scientific uh, uh, realms and academic realms. And that is physics, acoustics specifically, because if we really want to understand sound, uh, we need to look at the physics, the acoustics. Acoustics is a branch in physics that studies sound. Physicists specialize in sound, often called acousticians, know more about sound than anyone else. Uh, sound is also part of mathematics. What sound is, literally, it's mathematical ratios that you're listening to. Same with music. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to study how sound impacts the brain, we need to address it through neuroscience, biochemistry, sound changes the chemistry in the body, and so on and so forth. So using these academic and scientific Western uh, studies are, is a very important thing. Again, this is part of the multidisciplinary approach that I took to better understand sound, other than just looking at it through music. So. There must be a reason why shamanic societies have used sound, clearly. It's not a superfluous tool, it's a very, very powerful tool. And uh, here it's a very unique case because shamanic societies have used it in conjunction with plants. These plants can be plant teachers or plant hallucinogens, psychedelics, often called entheogens. There are many different forms, uh, different names of them and different types of uh, plants or non hallucinogenic plants. So I'll be addressing this aspect and how different shamanic societies use sound, for what purposes, and so on and so forth. It's a very, very rich class, so I'll be talking thoroughly about these various things. The last one is how to facilitate the sound meditation. 
which is, as I said earlier, an optimized um, experience to get the most out of the various tools that have been used individually. Huh? Uh, breathing exercises, something that one can use individually by itself. Stan Groff uh, and Christina, his best own wife, um, built an entire practice on that called Holotropic Breathwork. There are many different practices that deal only with the breath. Visualizations and guided visualizations, toning, vocalization, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to address something that's very important and central to understanding sound, and that is the harmonic series. This is something that I'll address thoroughly in, uh, in sound theory, but I'll talk a lot about in various courses that I'll be teaching. Harmonic overtones um, are very, very important to address if you're interested in sound. So basically, there are frequencies that are found in any sound that we hear. And these frequencies, most of the time, are so minute that the core note of any sound that we're listening to or the fundamental frequency can easily overshadow. For example, if you're listening to a note played on a violin or a note played on a flute or a clarinet, that one note is not really a one note. It may seem to be to you one note, but when you analyze it using computer software, electronic equipment, you will be able to see that there are many different pixels, many different lines, properties, aspects, that makes it a combination of a wide variety of different things, not just one thing, several different things. Um, they're found everywhere in any sound that we hear. Most of the time, the fundamental frequency is so loud, it masks or overshadows these overtones. But why are they there? Well, they're there to give any sound that we uh, hear its tone color. <coughs> Pete, I think your mic is on. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> uh, so um, they're there to give any sound that we hear its tone color or tamp. Sound has a color. Tamp is spelled T-I-M-B-R-E is a word uh, that comes from French, is used in English, uh, which literally means tone color. <coughs> so this is basically what makes people's voices to be different from each other, instruments sounding different from each other. It's how the overtones or the harmonics, sometimes people use them interchangeably, or they may even say harmonic overtones. Um, it's okay for now. Um, these overtones color the sound. It's very important to note that sound therapists and people who work with sound in contemporary days and in the past have always gravitated to using instruments that have clearly audible overtones. When you play a gong, these various frequencies, various notes that you hear are the overtones. When you play Himalayan singing bowls or crystal bowls, any disc, any bell, if you play the jiridu, if you play Jew's harp or jaw harp, more correctly, if you listen to overtone singing, throat singing, these are all different ways of using overtones. And um, as we know, these instruments are the primary instruments that are used in sound therapy. Why? Well, that's a very important question. It'll take me several hours to tell you why. But I'm going to talk briefly about these things soon and show you some examples. Um, so what we have now is uh, a video, a short video that I'll play. Um, so let me explain things first. You see two groups of lines. 
they're actually the same thing. They're just two different channels. One is a right channel, the other one a left channel. Okay? So, this is a recording of one of my Himalayan singing bowls. This is the depiction of how the sound looks like. But really zeroing in, kind of uh, playing, peeping Tom on sound. Using a software, a very sophisticated software, to give you a visual manifestation of sound. What you see there is several different horizontal lines, okay? So, uh, this is one example of the many different uh, scientific studies that I've done to really understand sound. I'll show you later on some additional ones. So, basically, uh, when I press play, you're going to hear the cursor going and playing all of these harmonics together. Basically, uh, you will hear how the singing bowl sounds when you strike it. All of the harmonics sounding together, except here, you're seeing what you're hearing. And then, after everything is played, there's another run through where the first or the lowest harmonic is being played. In its entirety. And then the second one, which will be a different frequency. And then the next one, and the next one. And the sound gets weaker, softer, or the amplitude goes lower. Amplitude is the dynamics of sound, the high and low, as the frequencies go higher. So these faint lines on top are the higher frequencies. And naturally, they're barely audible when you strike the ball. Why? Because the lower ones, the lower harmonics, that are louder sounding, would overshadow the finer ones. So in the playback, I will go through all of them, and you will hear dif these different harmonics one by one, and you hear how different they are. And at the end, you hear the entire thing. Okay? Here we go. this once again giving you another chance to listen and see it. So that's basically what the sound of a ball looks like. Um, if I were to do a different ball, it would look something close to that, but slightly different. Um, so more on harmonics. Oops. Oh, this one. This is, for example, the harmonic spectrum on a Shruti box. A Shruti box is a small squeeze box instrument that um, you bellow air into it and there are reeds inside that vibrate and the sound comes out. The sound is very similar to the sound of a harmonium. So it's a smaller instrument and it doesn't have a small keyboard. It has tiny slots that you open and you close to bring out notes. <clears throat> this is only one note. And notice how many harmonics there are in there. Of course, when you listen to that one note played on Shruti box, you won't hear all of these harmonics. You will hear a few of them, but as you start to meditate and quiet your mind and focus your awareness on the finer and finer frequencies, you'll get to hear them. And, um, but your, your body also experiences these harmonics. And it's very complex uh, relationship between these notes. There's a whole series. There's a, um, a specific formula that's being used here 
as to what occurs after what and so on and so forth. That's something I'll talk thoroughly about in, uh, in the courses. This is Native American Indian flute. Here I'm playing different notes with trills ascending and then uh, descending first and then ascending. And you'll see the various lines on top of that. This is a classical transverse flute. You notice that there are far less lines. It's the classical flute, basically the silver flute uh, that's played in the classical music. Notice that there are far less uh, horizontal lines above. That's probably why it's not used in sound therapy as much as other instruments. We as human beings, even without knowing anything about harmonics and about acoustics and mathematics and all these esoteric things, we gravitate toward instruments that have clearly audible harmonic overtones. When they are everywhere, the value again is when we use an instrument where we can clearly hear them. This is the spectrum of a gong. It's a, to be specific, 38-inch 38, 38 <coughs> symphonic gong. It's a zoomed-in version. Uh, you can zoom in and zoom out in the software. So notice how close they are and how um, packed and they go on so high up. They're so close to each other, almost touching each other. And again, with this software, you'll be able to single out one and play it by itself, or a combination of different ones. It's really fascinating what we can do now with technology, how much understanding we can gain from uh, you know, studying sound, right? Another thing that I'll talk about uh, thoroughly is cymatics. Cymatics is the study of visible sound and vibration. Typically, the surface of a plate, diaphragm, or a membrane is vibrated and regions of maximum and minimum displacement are made visible in a thin coating of particles, base, or liquid. Different patterns emerge in the excitatory medium depending on the geometry of the plate and the driving frequency. Cymatics were discovered by Ernst Kladny, born 1756, died 1827, who was a German physicist and musician. He is sometimes called the father of acoustics. So basically, sound has an image. Sound moves matter. Um, I'm going to show some examples. This is a metallic plate. And on this plate, there is fine powder. And when you subtract, this metallic plate to specific frequency, or when you use a bow, you bow the edge. This is how Kladni first did it. Uh, you get a specific image based on the frequency. But it's not just the frequency. There are other variables that people don't often address. Uh, connected to uh, the plate, how thick or thin the plate is, the size of the plate, the shape, the material the plate is made from, uh, what kind of powder there is on it, is it salt or fine powder in, in various forms, uh, the, uh, the temperature, the humidity. So it's not correct to say that one frequency will always have the same image. It's a lot more complex than that. In sound, things are always more complex than we think they are. They are. And that's why I often caution people of misinformation, disinformation, and being attached to <clears throat> general things. This note opens your chakra. That note does this. You know, this note opens your heart. Things are never this simple. And that's something we need to grow up to. And only through deep investigations and, and experiments and studies, and not just through reading something somewhere, watching something on YouTube that advertises this. And because of our passion and uh, need to believe, we run wild with it. Um, this field, unfortunately, is littered with uh, a lot of things that are not true, not um, 
proving it with a lot of unconfirmed rumors. So this is cymatics but in water. What you're looking at here is a bowl and uh, made from glass and filled with liquid and there's a spotlight right underneath colored bulb that is shining through it and a camera on top taking this image why is this important here because it's showing you the depth the other slide that i showed is the two-dimensional manifestation it's actually three-dimensional you can see that there is depth to it not just width, width and height so it's a, it, all of a sudden the, the image becomes more complex what we're dealing here is with hyperdimensional geometry geometry that we don't have theories for it yet we don't understand yet part of advanced physics and mathematics that we still cannot comprehend so sound has a very very complex and invisible aspect this is another image by the way these images are taken from a wonderful book that i highly encourage you to purchase it if you're interested it's called water sound images by a german cymatic researcher and photographer by the name of alexander lauterwasser or lauterwasser and um, he goes into a thorough explanation of these various experiences done uh, you can go to cymatics.org or google cymatics you get a lot of these images sometimes he dilutes the water with different uh, liquids uh, to increase the viscosity a bit maybe mixed with alcohol or something else um, look how beautiful this cymatic pattern is one may think that oh this looks like a mandala well maybe this is where mandalas come from maybe from deep states and meditation uh, yogis uh, advanced teachers may see these patterns in one's mind's eye huh? and they interpret them by drawing and painting and constructing mandalas which are not only seen in Buddhist, Hinduist, but also in Celtic cultures, in African cultures, in Voodoo religions, in a wide variety of different cultures that are not part of the Eastern philosophy, uh, countries that have where we find Eastern philosophies, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism, and so on. So, and, and the complex mathematics as well, um, if you're familiar with um, the golden mean phi or the golden ratio, you can see that these uh, arms, almost like galaxy arms, uh, follow that same mathematical ratio, which is 1.618, 3, 3, 9, 8, da, 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 to infinity. So um, this is another one immensely beautiful so there's a, something that i like to draw attention to is uh, the correlation between math beauty aesthetics and nature this is something that i address a lot in uh, the first course which is how intelligence manifests in nature through various mathematical systems that we take for granted uh, again sound is mathematics phi and pi obviously are mathematics um, and Fibonacci numbers and fractal geometry these are all part of mathematics the harmonic overtone series is certainly among uh, the different ways intelligence manifests in nature so um, I'm going to skip these. I give enough of uh, examples on cymatics. I'm going to talk a bit about um, this slide. Brain waves or neural oscillations. This is a graph 
And I'll show in a bit some graphs. Uh, part of the uh, EEG studies that I've done. The brain has five different brainwave cycles. We may call them um, gears, if we will. So the delta state is where the brain is operating on somewhere between 0 0.1 and 4 hertz. Hertz is cycles per second. And this is where the person is deeply asleep, but not dreaming. The theta state is where the brain is operating from somewhere between 4 and 8 hertz. It's a meditative, drowsy, and drifting down into sleep and dreams. Alpha state, 8 to 13 hertz, is when the person is awake, but mentally relaxed, not focused on anything, and not concentrating, and not doing any task that requires concentration. Beta state 12 to 30 hertz is when the person is alert, busy, concentrating, and engaged in activities. Gamma state 30 to 100 hertz is a hyper brain activity which is great for learning and creating. So the brain is often uh, tapped into these different gears. Not everything is in one gear all the time. Sometimes the brain, the different parts of the brain can deal with different uh, cycles simultaneously. Um, going over this so that I explain and show you um, some of the EEG studies that I've done. And that's basically uh, my subject's baseline mind. And basically what you're looking at is these two divisions. The one on the left is my subject's left hemisphere, and the one on the right is her right hemisphere. Activities start from the point that's close to you and goes deeper into it, so it's kind of three-dimensional. And the blue part is where there is no electrical activity. And the numbers you see on the bottom 0, 20, 60, 80, 100, and so on, is the hertz level, so that you know where the activity is, is happening <clears throat> and in what brainwave cycle we're experiencing different activities. <clears throat> in the center, you have a micro V, which means microvolt, because all of these activities can be measured using microvolts. A microvolt is approximately one millionth of a volt. Okay, so it's very, very tiny charge. Uh, that's why we don't get electrocuted. <laughs> so, um, blue is no electrical activity. Green is a little more pronounced electrical activity. And then we have red, yellow, and white. The highest peaks are the white ones, which means that the brain in that cycle is experiencing the highest level of activity. So this is a person lying down, wearing a mask, not listening to anything. But clearly, there is a lot of mental chatter, right? The monkey mind. This is what a monkey mind looks like. <laughs> so. Um, Notice the difference between this slide and the next slide. This is what happens when I play the gong for a few minutes, loud dynamics. All of the mental activities have diminished. It's the overtones in the gong that cause this diminishing of activities in the brain. The person all of a sudden is more present is more here. I'm going to back up so that you, see, you can see the previous one again. What the mental activities are indicating in the slide is an inner process of reality that's happening in our head. Reality comes out of thoughts. It's a very, very complex thing. I 
and won't go into the esoteric aspect. But um, it's deeply connected to reality. Think of this, for example, if you're at home sitting and all of a sudden you started thinking about remembering some difficult situation that you faced uh, yesterday or last week could be an argument or something that irritated you and you started focusing on it it only takes a few seconds for you to start getting agitated and ex to experience similar emotions to the emotions that you experience at that moment in time how is this happening you're no longer in that situation well that's because you're remembering that situation and thoughts create inner reality that kind of make you live that experience to a certain extent so you see what i mean by thoughts create reality they change your emotional state they can do a lot more and i can go a lot deeper but you you got what i, what I mean for now so when we are working with the gong or these instruments it's changing this mindset that is inside our head and allowing us to snap out of it and to be here to be subjected to sound and the more you work with the sound to give it your attention to scrutinize what you're listening to and become aware of these overtones and the, the different aspects of the overtones there are so many aspects that uh, I can talk about that but we don't have enough time now but Working with the sound is very important. As I said earlier, you are working with the sound. Your role as a receiver uh, is incredibly important to create this active participation. Um, so this is oops, this is the open fifth tuning forks C to G. Um, it's a very powerful interval. It's a fifth. So the fifth is a three to two ratio, by the way. Um, look how much it quiets the mind. Small Vietnamese gong that I use. Small Japanese bell, loud dynamics. And notice how different the soft dynamics would be. This is the soft dynamics, remarkably different. Now, this is not mental activity, where you see here the eruptions, especially in the left hemisphere. It's basically the limbic system being activated. The limbic system is responsible for emotions in the brain. Sound can heal. I don't say that sound doesn't really heal, but the more we work with it, the more it heals. But certainly the practitioner is not healing with sound. It's creating a chance for healing. But what I'm more interested here in, in explaining and addressing is that sound heals us when we give it our awareness, when we scrutinize what it's doing, tap into the ethos, a very important aspect of sound that I talk a lot about throughout the courses. Ethos is the most important property of sound. Ethos is a word in ancient Greek. Um, in use in English and other languages, which means the distinguishing property, the character, the personality, the spirit of sound. Kind of if you uh, remember the major scale sounds happy, if you're listening to a piece of music that's built on major scale, it's going to sound happy, lighthearted, easygoing. Minor communicates more uh, something sad or romantic could be spooky to some. So that's a different ethos. So the more you let yourself sink into this emotional state that the sound is evoking within you. And if you're familiar with Indian classical music, the raga system, raga, the raga is a mode. Mode is comparable to a scale. It's all about that sound basically allowing healing to happen from within you, or another way of saying it, sound would give way to the inner faculty within us to induce healing. It's allowing self-healing basically to happen. When you give your attention to sound, 
when you tap into the ethos and let the sound move you by giving it your attention. So you see how the idea is getting clearer. This, these are the principles that I work with. I try to demystify things as much as I can using science, using knowledge. There's still a whole lot of other things that we cannot demystify. I'm deeply interested in the esoteric aspect, but uh, unlike most people, I, I say that there are a lot of things that we can understand using technology with the right study and the right experiments, we can demystify a lot of things. If we always say, oh, sound is mystical, we can't understand it, we'll never understand it. We'll never make any effort. We'll always be intimidated, incapacitated, and realizing that we can't understand. We have great technology, computers, various software and, and, and advanced physics and specialists that can help us really understand what's happening in the brain when we're subjected to sound. Uh, computer software, various equipment to, to do analyses. Uh, yes, there's still a great part of it that we don't understand, but this may come later, but let's make some effort to really understand how sound heals and why it heals, how much it contributes to our well-being, how it reveals, how we are involved in the healing, all of these things, so on and so forth. <clears throat> this is the brain subjected to frame drum playing. So here you can see some electrical activity, but it's diminished. But what's valuable here is this coherence, the synchrony that you find between the two hemispheres, right? They're very similar to each other. This is very valuable to uh, get the brain in a specific state. So drum, drumming circles are very important. They do something very profound to us. This is also, I have experimented with the olfactory stimuli. Uh, this is here, Palo Santo. Palo Santo is sacred wood. It comes from the Amazon. It's used a lot in shamanism. A lot of you probably have smelt it in yoga studios. It's often used in holistic practices, in yoga. Uh, glasses and so on. So you see here the limbic system is going off the charts. So what happens when we smell Palo Santo, we feel elated, grounded, inspired, and so on. So these are the elements of the sound meditation that I was telling you about earlier. Uh, mindset, which is intentions, attention, will, setting, meditation, breathing exercises, visualizations, and guided visualizations. Verbal guidance, toning and vocalization, working with overtone emitting instruments, judicious and equanimous listening, very important, and olfactory stimuli. So I can talk for a couple of hours on each actually um, element here, but uh, we'll leave it to later on in the class <laughs> if you choose to join. By the way, you can get a lot of information on my website, soundmeditation.com, if you're interested. Um, so let's see. Maybe I'll uh, make a stop here before I go on and take some questions, uh, since it's uh, 7 after 8. Uh, Pete, do we have questions, please? <clears throat> Great. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, just going to switch it to me for a minute. And um, I put on the screen just some contact information, a link to the program, and a link to Alexandra's website and email in case you need to contact him. Uh, people can actually speak directly to Alexandra if they want to. Let me show you how to do that. Um, here's just a quick little graphic that will tell you how to click the right button and ask for the mic. There's a little button shaped like a hand. If you click that, I can un unmute you and you can speak directly and ask your question. The other option is to type in a question on the chat panel. So we have Leah here. Um, hi, Leah, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Could we turn on your webcam? Really? Oh, okay. Let's I'll see. tell you how to do that. How do we do that? Do you see your name there? Yeah. To the right of your name, click the button. To the right of my name? You mean like this web, this little camera button like that? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Okay, go ahead. All right. Okay, so I just give you my question. Hi, Leah. 
Hello. Hi. I'm really here. enjoying your um, your synopsis of what you do in the program. Thank you, Thank you very much. So my question is, are there um, characteristics of background of personality that are common to students who do well in your program in terms of understanding the material, being able to utilize it productively, doing well, um, as opposed to students maybe who don't do so well. What have you? What is your experience with that? that that's an excellent question that no one has asked before. I love, I love it. So yes, there are um, characteristics such as curiosity, mm. being open-minded. Uh, being able and willing to let go of what we once believed in, in what was once truth to us. Mm. These are all things that I personally went through as well. I'm trained in academia, in you know academic training, and I played music. But um, and I went to a great university, and I, I loved everything that I studied except it was skewed, it was through specific lenses. It did not address things as they really are in the world. Once I went out and started doing field work and seeing truly how things are in a non-academic, non-scholarly, non-scientific environment, I gained a deeper understanding, but I had to battle a lot, basically with cognitive dissonance, with what my psychology did not allow me to accept and understand in adopt because that's, that was not part of what I believed in. It was not part of what I thought it was truth, mm -hmm. standardized truth. So the more the person is willing for a different scenario, a uh, more upgraded version, being open, curious, and uh, having no inhibitions, being willing to do investigations, being skeptical is very important. I do encourage people to be skeptical. The problem nowadays, we're dying to believe. That's also something. Belief is very tricky. Reality springs out of belief. Reality really is the product of what we believe in and how we're conditioned. But it's very important to be skeptical so that we, we basically being skeptical is not being doubtful. Being skeptical means that I'm interested, but I need more proof for me to believe in that. That, that really comes with endeavor, with questioning, with um, thinking about something, researching it. This is where uh, the truth is. And, and the, the, what we can establish through this questioning is the most discernment. important thing. Absolutely. Using discernment, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And not just buying into it just because so-and-so said it, or I've read it here and there is getting us into very awkward and dangerous places, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. So that's briefly the most important traits and, and characteristics. Um, being open, curious, willing to let go of what they once believed in, being skeptical, doing additional work, reading, being inquisitive, taking the reins, basically, and becoming involved in their teaching, it, ultimately tapping into the inner archetype within us, the teacher archetype. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. You, you're welcome. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Leah. Um, Alexandra, there was one question on the chat panel from um, Anne Mary, but she does not have audio, actually, so we're hoping to get her the recording later on, but I'm just going to ask it in case somebody else has that question. Um, she's asking, um, how much of a clinical component does the course have? I just saw one clinic day. What does the clinical component look like? Yeah, um, I believe uh, John Beaulieu is giving clinic and also Sylvia Nakash. And uh, I will be giving an entire weekend of clinic. That uh, actually more than one weekend, two weekends primarily. And these would be the two classes are the instrumental technique class where basically I talk about various techniques on instruments and I spend time, a lot of time with students working on these instruments, practicing on them and working on each other, giving each other indiv individual sound meditation and small group sound meditation. 
I also give my students sound meditation so that they learn about the experience by receiving it, not just by giving it. Um, the second course that I'll go over the stuff I'll be, I'll be giving, sort of a clinic combined with theoretical stuff, uh, is uh, the one that we talk about how to facilitate the sound meditation. In that course, we address the clinic will not only deal with the instruments, but also with the, the other aspects that are involved in the sound meditation, the breathing exercises, guided visualizations, using words to bring awareness and uh, olfactory stimuli, using psychoacoustics and directionality of sound, how to move instruments around the body, why, and all of these things. So yeah, there'll, there'll be a lot of clinics. Uh, there's a lot of room for clinics, but you know we're limited with time. 120 hours are precious, and they need to be divided in a way that is covering uh, first things first. So we try to keep a balance. Other questions? Um, I just want to remind people we're open to have some pe more people ask for the mic. That's that symbol shaped like a raised hand. You can see it on your screen. Um, let's see. Um, Satya, I think, had a question. Yeah, and she's asking Hello, where she asked that. Satya, you can see on the screen where you can click the button, or you can just type it right into the chat panel, and we'll, I'll read it to Alexandra. So nobody else asking right now. Okay. I have more material to go over if there are no questions at this point. All right, so let me go through some other stuff. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know. Let me see. Is she going to ask? She's typing something now. Um, okay. Let me just ask her right now. Uh, okay. And she can hear me. So, Sanjay, type in your question if you want to, him to ask a question now, or what, we're going to move forward on the presentation. Okay, so... Oh, here it is. My question is, since sound is such a complex subject... She's typing. <laughs> Nothing more coming through. Do you want to proceed and then I'll, oh, how do you explain to people in a short time about the potential of sound for the future of medicine? <laughs> um, well, this is a charged question. So, um, sound affects so many things uh, in us on the mental level, emotional, and physical level. Um, Sound allows us to experience well-being. Therapy, eventually where healing is, by disconnecting us from the habitual patterns of the mind, the obsessive thoughts, the loops, the monkey mind that is the cause of our stress, this buildup of inner reality, going over scenarios and thoughts. Um, creates peace, but sound also affects and reset the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system is um, the parasympathetic and sympathetic. It's divided into two main categories. This is basically the part of our body that is responsible for all the things that are running all the time, whether we're awake attentive or busy with something else, asleep or even passed out, keeping the blood flowing, the heart beating, um, the enzymes doing their work, uh, the neurotransmitters flowing, and, um, pupils dilating and constricting saliva is being secreted and or not secreted, the, the bowel system functioning, all of these things, the respiration. So there's a lot of machinery to run. And this system is heavily affected by stress and daily routine. So sound affects it. 
most of the well-being that we experience is actually from the nervous system taking a break, getting a chance to recover, to heal itself, to reset, to snap out of the unhealthy baseline. Sound also affects our body, our cells, even uh, things within the cells called microtubules. This is very new science. Microtubules are tiny filaments, almost like conveyor belts, that are found in the cytoplasm, which is the area in the cell between the nucleus and um, the, 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 the edge, uh, the, the enveloping layer uh, of the cell. There are tiny filaments. They vibrate sympathetically with sound, sound that's not equal tempered. Eco temper is something that I talk thoroughly about in classes. So natural sound, just intonation, uh, type of sound that you get from gongs and bowls, all of these harmonics. So we're designed to receive sound, to um, create well-being from sound. So. Um, Sound affects various things that can go on and on. So definitely it's only a matter of a lot of studies and some time to realize how much sound can truly be the medicine of the future. Just to give you an idea what sound is being used for nowadays. Um, we can clear the calcifying plague that people with um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia can suffer from, sound can clear this out. And while leaving the healthy neurons and cells intact, we can help people retrieve their memories. Um, sound can be used to detect cancer. Sound can use for male contraception. So there are several studies that I'll go over in great details, all promising that sound truly will be the medicine of the future, primarily because it's non-invasive. But when I talk about these studies, I'm not talking about, oh, gong can clear your plague, you know, or person is suffering from something. No, no, we're talking here about um, high frequency ultrasound, sound that goes well beyond the hearing threshold, which is 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. That's the type of sound that we can't hear, not even bats can hear probably, very high. So sound can be used as a tool for operation. Um, even to make incisions to, can be used for a wide variety of different things. Um, so any, I have to also bring awareness to how powerful this tool is. Any tool that's so powerful you can do a lot of good with and you can do a lot of bad. Unfortunately, because of this power, sound is also used in military application and that's a very, very serious thing. So there's no easy way to answer your question, Satya. I had to go into this soliloquy. Uh, there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Is there another question, Pete, or anyone else has a question? Uh, nobody nobody uh, <coughs> now. And Satya says, thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Yeah. So um, what I go over with when I work with people is uh, give them techniques to keep their awareness on the sound, to, to share with them different ways of really knowing how to use sound. We talked about the active participation, there must be a way to do it. Well, this way is connected to what the individual does in their mind, kind of awareness to have. To judiciously listen to overtones, and I demonstrate these overtones playing instruments and show them visuals of them like I did, to become aware of the space between the overtones, is where the interval is. To explore the different register of these overtones. The register is basically the various frequencies. There are low overtones and high overtones. To observe the varying modulations 
this is the wavering, the beating that you, you heard in the, the singing bowl that I played earlier in the video. Um, the technical term in physics is modulation. To notice the varying dynamics, uh, how soft and loud these overtones are. To also <clears throat> use other techniques such as visualization, which is also used a lot by uh, Tibetan monks in meditation. Visualization is a really powerful technique, which deals with changing, altering uh, the way we see things or feel about things. Um, why does this work? Well, it's because really we don't understand reality. We don't understand where reality is. We're learning more and more, even through uh, physics, how reality is so much of an inner process, how much our emotions are involved in the way we perceive reality. So when we visualize something and <clears throat> opening our heart, work with various techniques that deal with our capacity to observe sound using the breath, we are changing reality as we experience it on the inside. And this affects the way we experience reality on the outside. What I mean here is not that changing the way reality would look like a tree would still look like a tree and a car horn would still sound like a car horn, but it's the way we feel when we are in certain environments. Are we uplifted or still depressed and feeling anxiety, feeling anxious? And, you know, it's just helping creating well-being. Yeah. So. Another aspect is to contemplate the shifting energy of the overall sound and of the overtones to allow oneself to be completely engrossed in sound to an extent where anything outside of that which you're observing would cease to exist. This is where you become the event and there's no more awareness of the observer. This is where um, you become aware of awareness itself. All of these things are very, very important to really have full command of our mind, to gain the reins, to disconnect from our ego's habitual patterns, and so on and so forth. Clearly, you see here, I'm bringing a lot of technique from meditation into working with sound. Why? Because my life experience taught me nothing but that. And also my work with individuals. It's all about paying attention. Why? because sound is leading you to something very powerful within you. I'm not crazy about people edifying sound and glorifying the mystical side of sound. Yeah, we know all of this, but how does it serve us? What does it do to us? How can we use it to a level where we become better and more uh, capacity to heal ourselves, to create a better world around us? to be more compassionate, to be more loving, to disconnect from irritating thoughts, to alleviate traumas, to create a better world in a wide variety of different ways. Uh, we need to discuss more where, where the sound takes us, why this happens. That's more beneficial. We desperately need something like that. We don't need to worship another thing. We've worshiped plenty of things. It's time now to empower ourselves and human beings. We tend to have a tendency to look for things to edify and glorify and worship. You know, when we work with a guru, it's not about the guru. It's about learning what we can do to become our own guru. So, Going deep into sound, into the sound until you reach time stopping ecstasy. This is something that happens to people where you're even beyond sound. You don't even hear the sound anymore. You're not awake, you're not asleep. You're in a very unique state that w would take me a few hours to talk about. But these are some things uh, that we can address. There's a lot more that I can share. But we're reaching ending time. I want to check in once again to see if there's another floating question or give people a chance to ask questions and you can also 
shoot me an email at a later point if question pops in your head and you may want to ask. Yeah, there, you can raise that, click that raise hand button if anybody has a remaining question or type a question in. I put on the chat panel links to um, the full details about the program and also contact information for your presenter, Alexandra, uh, to his website and an email address to reach out to him. I'm going to have the recording of this event available um, shortly afterwards so you can go back and look at it again and uh, review the information and presentation. Okay, so I um, hope to see um, some of you or all of you uh, in the program. And uh, any question you may have, please um, send me an email about. Uh, check my website, check the Open Center's uh, website, the, that page for the program that uh, Pete posted. Um, and hopefully we'll see you at some point. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Pete, for uh, running things efficiently and beautifully. And uh, see you at some point soon, hopefully.